we cannot even imagine. So please, thank you so much. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, I wanna do a quick test. Can you raise your right hand? I wanna see everyone's right hand because I want everyone to ask questions, everyone, <laughs> including the parents, okay? <laughs> So um, this session is for you, so make sure that you ask questions. I think what we wanna make sure that you get out of these sessions as we talk to you is we wanna make sure that uh, if you're a student, high school student or college student or the parent, um, you, you kind of envision, you start thinking about the possibilities that are available to you as you study STEM sciences, math, engineering, whatever you decide to do. I gotta tell you, there's no better place than to be in Florida right now as a math and STEM student. All these companies that you're gonna hear from, uh, all of my, uh, the next speaker, who's gonna talk about finance and math in hedge funds and finance. Uh, I'll talk to you about math and STEM in, in, in the environment, including agriculture. Um, and the kind of companies that are moving down to Florida and providing opportunities for us from SpaceX to Blue Ocean, uh, to, what's it, Blue Ocean? Oh, Jeff Blue Bezos. Origin. What's it? Origin. Origin, I'm sorry, Blue Origin. Um, to, you know, all these companies that are moving down and providing opportunities are incredible. So just food for thought, right? So if I could give advice to myself uh, 25 years ago when I was in grad school, I would tell myself uh, to, you know, not only concentrate so much in school and science and all the stuff I did, but also to pay attention to the people that are out there doing the type of work that gets you excited, that interests you. And make sure that you spend as much time connecting to them, networking with them, figuring out how they've done it. Because they should, you should have, when I coach and advise people, especially women, I always tell them, you know, like corporations. Corporations have a board of directors. You want to make sure that you, for yourself, you also have your personal board of directors, the people that have done this before, who can help you kind of think about the possibilities. So good for thought, okay? Now you know me, you know others here. Find me on LinkedIn, uh, connect if you want to talk offline. We can do that. So just make sure that you don't ever forget that the networking aspect about how people have done it is just as important. It will help you get there faster okay okay so today i want to talk to you about three things i want to talk to you about algorithms and we heard about algorithms in the morning session which is which is heard from dr jan about algorithms in retail and 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 uh, supply chain and by the way i will never shop shop the way that i've been shopping again every time i go to a store wherever i go and i see something on sale I'm going to think about her presentation. That was spectacular. The, the way that she explained that was spectacular. So there's so much math and al algorithms behind it. And I actually never thought about it. So we want, we're going to talk about algorithms. We're also going to talk about artificial intelligence. We don't have that much time. We could spend a whole week talking about AI. But I'm going to talk to you about AI. I spent the last 25 to 27 years working in AI. And my PhD is in electrical engineering with a specialization in AI from here at uh, UM. So I talked to you about AI. And I also then uh, wanna talk to you about algorithms and AI as we apply it to the environment, specifically agriculture, but also other parts of the environment. Is that good? So three things. So let's start with algorithms. So we talked about a few algorithms today so far. If you were here this morning, we talked about an algorithm, which is heard about algorithms in supply chain. So who can tell me in super abbreviated short form what an algorithm is? What do you think it is? A sequence of steps. Yeah. What is it? A sequence of steps. A sequence of steps. Oh, Any other ideas? What is an algorithm? A model for predictability? Yeah, like steps to get to get somewhere. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Okay, so yeah. A formula? A formula that can lead you to some outcome? Yeah. So an algorithm is, is exactly that, the set of steps. When we are at home, 
baking a cake using a recipe to follow the recipe to bake a cake. That recipe is an algorithm. It's an algorithm to bake a cake. We follow instructions. And believe it or not, most algorithms, most, most of the things that we do out there every day, without even thinking about it, like shopping, are all based on algorithms. And we're going to talk about a few, specifically later as they relate to the environment. Baking a cake, following a recipe, it's following the algorithm to make that cake. Now, are we using math in that example when we're baking a cake? Does our algorithm to make a cake have math in it? Yeah, what kind of math? How many cups of flour? How many, hopefully not cups, but grams of sugar? How many eggs, right? So a simple recipe includes math. Now, algorithm I think that has existed for thousands and thousands of years. If we go back in time and, and, and find out, you know, think about when was the first algorithm ever created? Um, when was it actually created? Does anyone have an, any idea how long ago that was and which one it was? What was the first algorithm ever invented? Let me guess, the pyramids. The pyramids. No, that's all. <laughs> that, that wasn't it. Yeah. A spell, right? oh, okay. Astronomy, in astronomy, but what was the actually algorithm? What was that algorithm? Yeah. Solar system. Light. The solar system. Light. Uh, that was it. That's a good one, but that wasn't it. Okay, one more. It's going to be time. Time. That's a great one. And time obviously is very old. But that was, a, that was a, the first official algorithm. The first official algorithm ever documented. It is not documented. It doesn't exist. So we go by based on when it was actually written down. Yes. Did you just Google it? Yeah, yeah she just Googled it. That was, that was, which I love. She's using her algorithm to perform. You're right. You're right. Oh, Google. Right. So the first algorithm ever created, it wasn't created or invented, it was discovered. Because a lot of this stuff exists. We just don't know that it exists, right? So, you know, you discover this stuff. We're, we're still in the process of discovering nature discovering how things work out there right so the first algorithm that was ever discovered and documented was a euclidean algorithm this by euclid and he um was able to figure this out imagine someone figuring this out like when i'm at home relaxing i'm watching netflix right someone's actually there like trying to figure this stuff out and he figured out that three thousand almost three thousand years ago that there is the notion of a common divisor. So if there are different numbers, integers, there's a number that we can actually divide both numbers by some other number without leaving a remainder, and that's a simple algorithm. What is the common divisor of two numbers? But that simple algorithm is now embedded in thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of things that we use every day. When you use your phone, when you use your computer, uh, you you know you we use encryption, we use SSL. Everyone knows what that is, right? SSL encryption. We use the Euclidean algorithm because cryptographic functions use it extensively. We if you have a boat here in South Florida, you go on your boat and you're using a GPS. It's using the Euclidean algorithm to do GPS calculations. Um, music. If you listen to music and if you have a beat, the beat. It's calculated based on the Euclidean algorithm. So imagine like the impact that we can have by discovering or creating in quotes because we're discovering them, these algorithms, right? So the algorithms that we just heard about about supply on supply chain, these are things that I'm sure when they were created or, or, or discovered, they were created because someone thought I gotta have a better way to shop, right? That was an it. But uh, we can use these things in ways that we can't even imagine. So Keep that in mind. So the first algorithm was uh, discovered about 3,000 years ago, and we're using thousands and thousands and thousands of programs or applications. Um, so um, algorithms have been around for a long time. We continue to use them you know, every day. Can you think about, I, I need three thoughts. I'm sure you can have more than three on things that you use every day, maybe that you have here with you today, that use algorithms. We just talked about Google and your phone. 
What else? What else do you think between this room that you say algorithms? The thermostat, yeah. It's constantly calculating the temperature, yeah. The camera, of course, every every digital device is using algorithms, but also non-digital devices are using algorithms, right? So um the cake, you know, the, we talked about the recipe for the cake, that's that an algorithm. So I think it would be algorithms today. Anything else about algorithms that you might want to ask before we move on? Because algorithms is the foundation for what we're gonna talk about in the next half an hour. So let's talk about AI. And I've been working with AI for you know 25, 27 years. Um it used when I got my PhD here at UM 25 years ago, and we were working in AI, um, we didn't have back then all the frameworks uh, and technology that we have today to be able to make AI capabilities available very quickly. Has anyone ever worked in the field of AI? Yeah. Yes, <laughs> well, she works for a hedge fund. So she probably uses lots and lots and lots of AI that she, she's gonna talk to you next, she's amazing. But um, if you haven't, if, you, um, if you're interested, it's actually today very, very easy to go uh, download a framework, an AI framework, that you can code AI programs in, in Python or whatever language you want to code. The framework, I personally use uh, a little Python right now. Um, I use a uh, free framework like PyTorch. You can download it, put your code in it. They come preloaded with AI capabilities. So you don't only need to code, I'll tell you how we used to do it 30 years ago, 25 years ago. You can just literally drag and drop capabilities and use them. So if you wanna train your own GPT, chat GPT like model, you can literally go pull down, uh, like a, you know, drag and drop a box that says this is a transformer algorithm, which is the foundation for a large language model. And you can say, here's my data, Whatever you want to train it with, it could be energy, it could be whatever you want to train it with, you pass it, you know, you connect them physically, and the data trains the algorithm and you get an outcome. So building an AI model today, it, I know it sounds really complicated, but trust me when I tell you, it's actually very easy to do. We've got to go 25, 27 years later, after we start heavily investing our time in AI, that we can build these capabilities in such an easy way that anyone can do. I, I have a nephew who's 11 years old, who just turned 11. He learned how to code when he was little, like six years old, he was coding in Scratch and then, and then Python and other things. He just downloaded from the web PyTorch, you know, a couple of weeks ago, drag and drop, created his own chat GPT like version, trained it with a couple hundred images that he took, and now his little personal large language model can identify his toys in his eyes. So when he takes a picture of the toy, he can say, see mom, I don't have that one. Or yeah, mom, I have that one, right? So um, these are things that are very, very easy to do right now. It used to be that when we started working in this space, it wasn't so easy. So when we were doing it here at UN 25 years ago, we didn't have the frameworks, we didn't have the capability. So we had to build all these from scratch. We had to actually create what we call the roads. We had to build our back propagation capabilities, build all the linear algebra, and you know, it wasn't dry as well. So, so that was um, a lot of work. Nowadays it's not. But a lot of um, a lot of time and effort went in, you know, from people working in this space for the last 20 years to make it to take it to the point that, that we're, we're now, which is really easy. Now, who can tell me the difference between an algorithm that we talked about before, like the recipe to bake a cake? And an and AI algorithm, what's the difference? So I, so we know that AI, artificial intelligence, is algorithms. It's just a bunch of algorithms. But what is the key difference between a traditional algorithm and an AI algorithm? Anybody knows? Yeah? Is it that the algorithm will change over time? The AI algorithm change over time, yes. And why is it that they change over time? What do we do with them? What's that? Self learning. Self learning. Self learning. Self -learning. Self -learning. Oh, machine learning. Self learning. Self learning. Self -learning. Self -learning. Self -learning. Self -learning. Self -learning. Absolutely. They change over time. 
because they learn. So this is really, really important. The foundational difference between a plain old algorithm that we've had for 3,000 years, like the Euclidean algorithm, and an artificial intelligence algorithm. When we talk about AI, we're talking about algorithms that can actually learn. And that sounds scary, right? But it's, it's not really scary. So I'm going to tell you how that works and why that works. And that's really important. Because when we talk about that was my second topic, right? We talk about algorithms, we're talking about AI. When we talk about the third topic, we're going to talk about nature and agriculture, but nature in general, and how <laughs> all these algorithms in nature that exist, but we still don't quite understand, are algorithms that learn. And we're trying to struggle with uh, in, to turn them, uh, to understand them so that going forward, the things that we build in technology, in engineering, with, uh, any, you know, anything that we build, it's based on the notion of how nature works, right? That we don't build things just to build things. We build things that can learn, uh, and we build them based on foundational work that's out there, which is in nature. So we're going to talk about that last. But AI as algorithms that learn, that is the key word, learning, is the keyword for AI. So how do we make something learn? How do we how do we how do we actually do it? How do we learn? For us to learn, what do we have to do to be able to learn? Like if I sit here and I just look at the walls, am I gonna learn much? Probably not, right? So what do I actually need to be doing to learn? Communicating? Communicating. Optimizing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's absolutely absolutely uh, goal right there. So we need to have the data to be fed into the algorithm to be able to learn. We learn from data. Now, we humans, we don't. It's not like we're plugged into a wall and we are feeding that data into a machine. We're not doing that, right? But we're capturing data every single time that we're out walking around, that we're talking to people. We talk to people like right now you're listening to me. So you're learning based on data. I'm, I'm conveying data uh, by talking to you. It's linguistic data. Believe it or not, uh, linguistic data out there is only about 35 to 38% of the communication that we do with each other. Most of the way that we communicate is non-linguistic. And that's a challenge that we have when we with training AI today, because the only way that we know how to train AI today is by providing AI uh, algorithms and models, linguistic data. We can feed it images, or we can feed it data, a voice, or we can feed it text, right? But there are so many things that are non-linguistic that we use to, go, to learn from each other, and they're not written on a text or a book. They're not in a, a YouTube video or in a blog or in Snapchat or whatever, whatever we use, right? So they're not physically there linguistically for me to grab and feed, feed a model. And that's one of the challenges that we have today with AI. Now, when we talk about nature, including agriculture, most of what we need to learn to train our models is non linguistic And that's a challenge. So a lot of the research that's going on in this space when it comes to nature, agriculture, the weather, and, and other things, um, it's not only about building these models, like Dr. Yang was talking about, how do we think through these models to find the best right? How do we think through these models to do X, Y, Z? But also, how do we capture data? Like, how do we actually get this data? Because we need data to train. And that's a challenge. That might not be a challenge um, when Olga talks to you about financial services later on. After me, uh, you know, hedge funds, financial services, we, we have a lot of data, historical data, from transactions, right? In other, and I spent a lot of time working in financial services too. In other areas like nature and agriculture, we don't, we don't have data. We don't have data. So I've done extensive work, for example, that we might be another time or we can talk offline and I'll give you some examples, extensive examples of what I've done. But I've done work in nature, working um, with the weather center uh, here in Miami to predict hurricanes. You know, we know that hurricane is coming seven days before. How do you think we got to the data? How do we, 
hopefully, and hopefully the content, you know, they'll come into the right place, right? So we can plan ahead. But how do, we, how do you think that we capture this data? How do we know that? These are models that we build. And the models, the code, if you watch TV and watch these phones, they constantly change, right? They, they go you know, here, they go this way. So they are constantly being updated based on data. How do you think we capture that? What is the data that we use to build these models? The, to improve the models or to, or build, to build them? them. To build them and, and improve them because they are real time. To so improve the flying hurricanes and collect data and use satellite data. Yeah, we use satellite data. We have the planes that go inside the hurricanes and they capture all kinds of stuff. But we also have hundreds of buoys all over the ocean measuring water, uh, water temperature. We have uh, sensors all over the place measuring wind speed at the airport and here and there. Uh, we have uh, sun intensity sensors measuring the, the intensity of the sun. We have humidity sensors, and these are spread out all over the place. And all these data points, we're capturing all this data that then is, then it's all fed real time to these models that we built, that then tell us you know, how the cone is changing, right? Um, so that's Oh, that's great, and, and we've invested 25 years worth of that um, research because hurricanes for us here are extremely important. I mean, that means it would mean having a house or not having a house in a day, right? Um, other things are, are just important, but we don't see the importance so much, and we haven't historically. One of them is agriculture, right? And I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, just less than 10 years ago, we used to have, for example, 600 types of banana. In the Winter Public, we used to have a banana 20, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. There were many, and I'm not talking about plantains. Plantains are different fruits or different vegetables. What fruits? The different fruits. I'm talking about banana. You had different colors of banana, bananas with different colors. You had different types of crops coming from all over the place. Who can tell me how many crops of bananas? Do we currently have around the world, not talking about plant babies or the low baby bananas, just a plain old chiquita banana, right? <laughs> how many types of bananas do we have today? How many crops? How many types of banana? Two or three. Two or three. That's which we came from. We have one. Okay. From hundreds and hundreds of decades. So when these crops, I, I remember growing up. I'm from Buenos Aires. Growing up in Buenos Aires, you know, you know, well, then very a long time ago, all the coffee came from Colombia, right? I don't know if it's still the case here, but most of the coffee came from Colombia. Uh, you know that most of our coffee to the US today comes from Singapore because Colombia's coffee production is decimated. And this is not only because of climate change, but because of, we are getting diseases and nutritional issues and problems that are directly affecting our crops and the crops will disappear, right? So uh, unlike the weather in agriculture, for example, we don't have models that are telling us that this is happening. So all of a sudden we go to public and there's only one banana. You like it or not, that's what you're eating, or no banana for you, right? But um, we don't know what is happening. And like we have no models saying there's something that is about to happen in seven days, like the hurricane that's coming, that's going to wipe out your crop, do something about it, go spray copper, go do whatever you need to do to prevent this disease or this issue from attacking your crop and try to save it. So that's what we're working on right now. Not that I'm an expert in agriculture, but it, it's, uh, it, there's a huge opportunity to do good, right? So, so we're doing that. So when it comes to AI models, we're able to train them, and that's the key. They learn, and they can step continuously learn. And that's because we, we call it artificial intelligence because we are trying to create these models in the way that our brain works. We're continuously learning. I'm, I'm learning from you as I talk and I watch you. If I see you smiling and going like this, I'm like, yeah, okay, <laughs> this is good, you know? But if I see you guys falling asleep, I'm like, okay, yeah. I gotta change the subject very quickly. So we're dynamically learning from each other. So we do this with artificial intelligence to do this. Now, we have a, a, a huge issue with the state of AI today that as an engineer, when I give presentations, I always talk about, but um, it's not something that we're gonna solve very quickly, but it's an issue. So the issue is that um, today, 
we see our uh, artificial intelligence industry, which is obviously heavily math um, dependent, because if you remove the covers and look inside the black box, AI is all math, it's all differential equations and linear algebra and, uh, you know, whatever you do. Uh, if you want to be in the field of engineering, if you want to be in the field of AI, if not only developing AI, but using AI, you have to try to understand what's going on under the covers. And it's all math, it's all math, right? So um, the challenge that we have today is that everything we do in technology today runs on what? What are on, on the chips that we run on, right? <laughs> What is the material that the chips are running as we develop with? What is the material, the element in the periodic table that we use to build our chips? Silicon. Hmm? Silicon. Silicon. And absolutely right. He's a professor here, so of course. <laughs> silicon. And what is silicon? What is it? What is the actual raw material? When you go to the beach and you're walking on the yeah. sand, that's it. That is chips. When we when you look at a computer chip, the computer chip is silicon process, but the raw material is sand. And we have an abundance of sand. And so we never run out of chips. I mean, when we have a whole supply chain issue going on, right? That's a different story. But when it comes to the raw material, it's a great product to build our chips. Now, chips are sand. Base silicon, sand base, and sand is a semiconductor. Meaning what? What does that mean when something is a semiconductor? Conducts conducts electricity either on or off. And that's why when you, if you study computer science and, and eventually when you go to college, study computer science, you learn that you know semiconductor is tied to on and off, Boolean algebra, zero or one, which is tied to binary, binary zeros and one. And that's tied to electricity being on and off. And that's all because of the underlying chip that we're at, the uh, material that we're using, which is sand, right? When we look at us, when we're trying to create AI, artificial intelligence, and we're trying to mimic or recreate sort of how our brain works, are we made out of sand, semiconductors? No, what are we made out? What's the element that makes us? Carbon. And is carbon is a semiconductor or a conductor? Carbon is a conductor. So it's a completely different underlying uh, technology. Conductor, which is a semiconductor. That's why our bodies, you know, when you talk to the medical folks in the medical field, they tell you, we, we are not programmable like a computer with zeros and one binary high level languages. We are molecular program. Molecular programming means we're running on conductive conduct technology, we're not semiconductors. We're not on and off. It's not like, you know, you have a headache and you take a Tylenol and then the headache is like off. No, we don't, we don't work that way. We take the Tylenol and then things happen inside our body and uh, it's molecular programming. So it is a process and, and many things happen at the same time. It's a different type of programming than being on and off, right? So. When we talk about truly translating AI, artificial intelligence, the way that our brain works, that we work, the way that we learn, what, what is the, the notion of consciousness, the notion of love, the notion of uh, uh, being nice to someone, like whatever you can think of, evilness, right? the, the notion of how we work to the notion of how we code a computer, it's the way that we do it today is not really possible. It's not feasible. We're never gonna get to true general intelligence the way that we're doing things today. It doesn't mean that we're not gonna create better, la la larger la 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 language models, better GPT, chat GPT version. We're not gonna create better products. We're gonna do that. We're gonna do better things. But the true notion of intelligence is a completely different architecture. Does that make sense? Completely different. So we have a lot of work to do. And what we have been doing, I have a, um, I didn't tell you about my background, but when I grad, right now, I'll tell you about my background later, but right now um, I have a, um, a, a startup in artificial intelligence, that's what we're doing today. We are trying to figure out what is gonna be that next architecture for general intelligence, artificial general intelligence, 
that it's kind of beyond the capabilities of things that we can do now. When we're concentrating in the environment and specifically agriculture, agriculture because we just need to spend that there with the work. Um, but I'll give you some, I'll give you some thoughts on that, right? Why is that important? Um, plants, not only humans, but plants and animals, and everything in nature is carbon-based, it's molecular based. So we're trying to figure out how does that really work when it comes to program, right? And so foundation of that, right? And then um, well, there are some things from an architecture perspective that just will never scale the way that we're doing things today. For example, our brain to work an entire day, 24 hours, it only uses to, to, to function the entire day, our brain uses 20 watts of power. 20 watts, that's almost nothing, right? And imagine all the things that you can do from the involuntary things like breathing and walking and whatever to thinking and, and planning and whatever. 20 watts, do you know, do you have any idea how long it costs, how, how much power we need to not only run, but only to only train, only train ChatGPT, which is the latest transformer model algorithm that we have in AI. So everyone knows ChatGPT, right? Everyone, it's a model, it's an algorithm that we turn into a model and then we train it so that it can answer things for you. It's a language model. And it's pretty good, right? <coughs> but just to train, ChatGPT, just to train it, we need 10 gigawatt, giga, uh, gigawatts of power with only to train it, which is, which is um, the, the same amount of power that we need to, um, let me get this right, it's, if, we, if we provide power and electricity to a thousand homes for an entire year, that's 10 gigawatts, 6 gigawatts of power. So just to train one single language model, and there are so many now available to answer whatever we wanted to ask, right? Um, we are consuming an exorbitant amount of electricity that is unsustainable if we want to scale and build AI in a different way. Does that make sense? Like go from you know 20 watts that your brain needs to work every day, an entire day to the entire power of a thousand homes running for a, for a full year, 365 days, just to train judging. So what we're doing today, the architecture that we're, that we're implementing today to build AI is not something that is sustainable, right? So what we're working on is we're working to figure out what is gonna be that next generation of architecture. How are we gonna do it better? And believe it or not, it makes, should make sense, right? The way to do it better is the way that we do it in nature, that we do it naturally. So um, we're, we're investing a significant amount of time in nature, agriculture, to be able to figure out what are the capabilities that we need to know. So um, the, we have, uh, in my current startup, we have built a significant number of algorithms that we turn into models. You take an algorithm, a recipe, you turn it into a model, you train it with data, and it produces the outcome, you know, the, the model that stuff that's already trained, that keeps uh, learning from itself as it works, and keeps uh, training itself, and that makes it AI, as we talked before. And we're doing it in, starting to do it in architectures. There are gonna be architectures that are gonna go beyond what we can possibly do today. And we'll have, um, a few hours to go over how we're doing it, but another time I can work with you that. Agriculture is extremely, ex uh, uh, plants in general, it's an extremely exciting space to do it because there are protocols and algorithms in nature, in agriculture, but in nature in general, that happen, things that happen that we still don't understand. For example, has anyone ever tried to grow roses? In Florida, have you tried to grow roses? Not in Florida. Okay, who's tried to grow roses? Did not, you not, not in Florida. Not in Florida. Why not in Florida, Olga? Just moved here. Today. <laughs> she just moved here. Okay, bad answer. That's, not... <laughs> That's a good answer, but why is it that we cannot grow roses in Florida? We've grown roses all over the world, right? But why is it that we can't grow roses in Florida? Yeah? The soil. What's, what's, what's up with our soil? 
What's what's wrong with our soil? It's sand. I mean, it's great. We love it, right? Because we can grow mango trees. We love mangoes, right? Um, but it's sand. For anything that's carbon or uh, organic matter intensive, meaning we can't do it here. Well, we can we can grow things that grow well in sand, like mango trees or papaya or, or whatever. Uh, uh, guava trees, but when it comes to things that need a lot of organic matter, we can't do it. Why can't we do it? Because it's just not the right soil. Right? Uh, but do you know that there are some plants that have evolved, some roses. There's one rose called the Cherokee rose. I just recently found it. A Cherokee rose, and if you ever want to know how to find it, yeah. connect to me on LinkedIn and I'll send you all the information. You can actually buy it. Um, there's a rose called the Cherokee rose that you can, um, well, I'll tell you, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, I we spent quite a bit of time in the Smoky Mountains with my husband, just, uh, you know, to get away uh, from Florida and all that's there, just trying to go somewhere else. And um, there's an area called Cherokee in North Carolina. I haven't been there, it's beautiful. And it's where the Cherokee Nation used to be. Well, they're still there. Uh, it's by the Smoky Mountains. And they have rose bushes everywhere. And I'm like, how are they growing rose bushes? In this, you know, area, and they said, "Well, it's these rose, they they get home and try to grow it." And I did, and it's thriving here. So when you start looking inside, uh, the, you know, why it, inside the, the plant, you know, the verticals of the plant, you realize that there are some very unique things in the in the rootstock of this plant, verticals of this plant, that makes it thrive in sand in our rocky sandy soil, like right? limestone rocky. So then I said, okay, great, but uh, the, the Cherokee rose is, is great, but I don't only want to grow Cherokee rose. So then you know, then, then you realize that if you learn how to graph, which I did, I learned how to graph, you can take any rose bush, any rose bush that you can possibly think of, take a sign, a little bugwood from it, a little piece of the rose bush they like, and graph it on this Cherokee rose bush uh, rootstock, and you can end up growing any rose that you want on this Cherokee rose uh, rootstock. And by the way, the Cherokee rose is a vine, so it's not climbing up your house. You can turn any rose in Florida into a thriving Florida soil rose that starts climbing up your, you know, your property. And you should come over to my house and see all these rose bushes that I have now climbing up. They want us to go, but yeah, that's another story. They are climbing all over my property. So these are protocols that we have in nature, right? When you connect the rootstock to a scion or to a bad wood, and that, that rootstock and, ba and, ba and scion connect and heal, it triggers communication between the two that nobody understands. No one knows how this happens, but it happens. And all that you're in technology, I'm picking on you because you're my friend, and you're in technology. But how much time do we invest in technology, right? Trying to make APIs, application programming interfaces, connectivities between us work in a customized way. How much money and effort do we do we invest in when nature has these protocols already available and working in miraculous ways that can help us connect things? In a way, you know that we can't even imagine how this works, right? So what we need to, what we are doing, and we need to continue to do is continue to invest time and effort trying to understand the protocols, the mathematical foundations, um, the uh, the algorithms that are available in nature, so that we can truly start creating in te I mean, technology. So we can truly start creating in technology products that are sustainable. And I'm going to take, I'm, I'm making this up of the, you know, I'm playing this because of what I said earlier. That are not only sustainable, but they're also going to take 20 watts of electricity versus the power that we need for a thousand homes for a whole year just to train. And we can do that if we start figuring out how nature does it. And that's what we're investing time in agriculture. Does that make sense? As a technology. So let me take a breather before I continue and see if anyone has any questions or thoughts. Any thoughts? So, yeah. so why is there so much negativity about GMO? About GMO, yeah. Okay. So unofficially, this is not the UN, it's just me and my experience, right? Uh, I think GMO has a bad rep, right? 
Uh, the reality is that the reality is that when you graph in, in root so when you go and buy an orange or or any fruit, an, an apple, every orchard out there, they are not planting a seed and growing the tree from the seed. Because when you plant the seed and you grow the tree from the seed, it takes about 15 years for the for the tree to fruit. So what they do instead is they have rootstocks and then they plant, they take a little backward from a tree that's already blooming. And when they graft it, that little plant starts blooming all away. When you do that from that graft, from activity, DNA can change already move back up. It's already, it's a visit trait. It already moves back and forth. So a lot of the stuff that we eat today is already genetically changed by natural grafting. Now, we don't have, okay, so am, am I, uh, do I believe that, so, so the, the challenge is when we try to do that in the lab, and that's the challenge, right? We don't want to use um, CRISPR to change the genes of the plant so that then we can give you oranges that we manipulated in the lab. That's another story from that. But the reality is that the gene change already happens naturally. So you can take an apple, food stock, it's the same family, and you can put a pear canyon, and when that heals, DNA is from the apple tree will move through the pear tree. So the gene transfer is already happening. But nature has protocols that say, this is a good transfer and this is not. So if it's not a good transfer, the plant's gonna die. When we do it in the lab, we don't know what to do. Yes. Okay. Exactly. So I think that's the fear. The fear is because we don't understand it. That's my question. That okay? Any other question? So we talked about AI, we talked about algorithms. Uh, I gotta also be completely transparent and honest. Uh, I use math my entire life for everything I do. I've never been good at it. <laughs> I haven't. It's not like my best subject in school was always math. But I struggled. I was a big student. I was a big student or you know, maybe the occasional team, right? In math. And I loved it. And it's my favorite subject, my favorite teachers. Uh, and I want to make sure that I share that because Yes, lots of success and great career, but you don't have to be the best. You know, you can struggle and, and still do it. So good for thought. We, we, we heard from Dr. Yang, and she's amazing. You know, and she, she had her struggles too, but she's brilliant. I, I'm not in that strong in life, but, but everything I've done, if I had a lot of pattern, you know, uh, like uh, math-based, and I wasn't it, I'm a student. So good for thought. Okay. Any other question? Do yeah. Do you want to tell them about Turing tests so they're not that really scared the Turing test so they're not really scared about AI? The Turing test? Yeah. Oh. That nobody likes it. Okay, you tell them about the Turing test. Hmm. Um, that's going to go against, that's a little bit shocking <laughs> for most of you, but AI is sentient, right? As a machine, it truly doesn't exist, right? It's a little bit more of a threatening <laughs> than the reality of mathematics behind it. Artificial intelligence, as we know, it existed since 1940s, since Turing put together the machine thing to code it, the NASA code, right? It was very slow, very clumsy, but it's the first artificial intelligence we experienced. So a Turing test is something that he invented and that's right now used. It's actually hard to describe in definitionally, but it's, um, <clears throat> I'll give you an example. When you get on the phone with a customer- It goes down to your talk. It goes down to your talk. It's chat box, right? Uh, it's um, usually in about question two or three, right? You know you're talking to a machine. You know what I'm telling professional sure. driving, right? That's the jury test. So in today's world, before you like walk out and start to be the way I not single machine can pass the jury test. So it's exactly what Dr. Ross was saying. We are carbon light. We don't think in ones and zeros. We are multiple outcomes in the given point of time. Psychology uses words saying that we are 
uh, what, what do I call that? We're associates of them, right? We're not dependents of them. So, seriously, we, we have life. We're not going to be replaced. No, and when you figure out what I mentioned earlier, right, that the foundational architecture of how we're building AI or technology in general is so drastically different from the way that we, our intelligence works. Can you possibly imagine a technologist coding, uh, writing the software to simulate love or <laughs> like feeling, I have feelings for you? How do we do that in code? We can't do that. The, the, the notion of consciousness, well, there's no way we can prove that. Mm -hmm. So, and that's, that goes back to the foundational, which you would say the foundational architecture of what we're trying to code AI in today is not the same architecture of how intelligence works. That doesn't mean that there are going to be, there are not going to be amazing things that are going to be developed. We're going to see more versions of language models. Mm -hmm. you, you know, something else to keep in mind is that um, everything that we're hearing about right now when it comes to AI tends to be tied to language models, diffusion models, creating images, right? Creating language models, chat to be like all these, all these things that we're hearing about now in 2023, 2024 are based on one single AI algorithm called the transformer. There are thousands of AI algorithms that we train, thousands. So it's going to get to the point where this whole notion of transformer discussions, large language models, chat GPT, Lambda for, you know, uh, the new models that are coming out for face, from Facebook, from Google, uh, stable diffusion, all the stuff that we're hearing about, eventually it's going to fizzle out. We're going to realize that it's just another phase of AI, but we have thousands of models or algorithms and models that we're training in the background that, are, that have nothing to do with transformers. So, this is something that's going to keep growing and growing and growing. It's, an, it's a super exciting area. Math is foundational for everything that I talked about today. So, even though I am not, you know, a math, I by no means to do what Dr. Yang does, but what the professors here do in terms of teaching math, that's not my, you know, again, my strong suit, but I can tell you that I, everything I've done in my career, I use math. So you have to have that foundation. You have to know how to do it, okay? Uh, the last thing I'll leave you with is with my current startup, um, we are, we have built technology uh, AI models and we train them uh, that we give away to farmers uh, that they can actually go to their, uh, they can have, devices that are looking at their crops or they can do it with their iPad or their phones and they can look at their crops and they can tell them a week before it happens like the models for the hurricane right that tells us, tells us that the cones that tell us that the hurricane is coming seven days before it comes we can tell these farmers that they are seven days away five days away ten days away from their crops being attacked by something so we're getting there we're getting to the point that we're able to help these farmers figure out what is about to happen before it happens, and they can take action, right? And I, along the way, we're discovering all kinds of incredible things, such as, you know, how plants communicate, how plants talk to each other, plants talk to each other through chemical signals in the air, they talk to, to each other through microbial networks under the ground, we're trying to create models for that. How does that, how does that actually work? How are these plants talking to each other? We see plants that are being attacked by insects and they start producing chemical signals. And then we see down the road other plants that are starting to produce the same chemical signals because the microbes and networks that are alerting each other. This is the foundation for cybersecurity, right? This is cyber. This is what we do with cybersecurity. So all these protocols are trying to train them in real life. We have them working in nature. So anyway, I think about that. Thank you. All right.